tonight, we have the first in a series about the remarkable continent of Antarctica. William Brangham and producers Mike Fritz and Emily Carpo spent two weeks there. And for the rest of April, they will be reporting on climate change, tourism, and the history of the vast ice-covered continent at the bottom of the world. But they begin with a story about a man dedicated to studying the penguins who live on the Antarctic Peninsula and how they are adapting to a warming environment. It's part of our weekly series on the leading edge of science. Hi, buddy. For more than 35 years, Ron Naveen has been coming every year to Antarctica. I can't believe it. I have the best job on the planet. Is that right? <laughs> Well, I'm a penguin counter, for God's sake. <laughs> Can't beat that, can you? No, I don't think you can. Bingo. Naveen is a former lawyer for the Environmental Protection Agency, but he left government work back in the 1980s to start Oceanites, a nonprofit that tracks the health of three penguin species that breed on the Antarctic Peninsula. It's home to millions of these charming, occasionally awkward, flightless birds. The Antarctic Peninsula is the 800-mile-long stretch of land that branches off from the northwest corner of the continent. This region has been warming faster than almost anywhere else in the world, and Naveen says that warming is having a dramatic impact on penguins. Because I've been coming here for so long, I've seen these changes. I've seen the penguin populations at certain colonies thin out pretty dramatically. One colony that we studied at Deception Island has gone from an estimated 90,000 breeding pairs to 50 or fewer. 50,000 wow. or fewer. 90,000 down to 50? Yes. That's a huge drop off. Right. But these penguins can teach us something about life on the planet. Some species are going to be major climate change winners, and there are going to be other species that are no longer able to thrive on the Antarctic Peninsula. And the changes that we've seen have been so rapid uh, that it's really important that we're down here every year to monitor them. And for more than two weeks, we followed Naveen and Humphreys on this remarkable continent as they trudged through snow, hiked up rocky peaks, and went into areas few humans are allowed to see. The three different species they've been tracking are Adeles, with the distinct white circle around their eyes, chinstraps, named for that thin marking across their faces, and gentoos, with the orange beaks. Antarctic penguins are just unbelievable animals. You know, they've been around for 60 million years. Grant Humphreys says these birds have long survived and thrived in some of the most inhospitable terrain on the planet. Life here for the birds has never been easy. There are predators everywhere from the sea, like this leopard seal, and from the sky, like these skuas flying overhead, constantly raiding penguin nests. But now they're facing a host of new threats. Krill, the tiny shrimp-like creatures, which are the penguins' main food source, are declining. They're being heavily fished to supply the booming fish supplement industry, and everything down here eats krill, including the resurgent population of whales. But climate change is also believed to be harming them. That's forcing penguins to dive deeper and travel further in hopes of finding food. It's all led to a rapid decline for the birds on the peninsula. Adelie populations have dropped by nearly 75% since 1990. Chin straps have in some locations dropped by half. But remarkably, the Gen 2s are actually thriving. Their numbers have grown sixfold over the same period. Researchers believe it's because they've adapted and are now eating more fish instead of krill. And as the breeding season gets harder, they're relaying their eggs a second time. There's a real lesson for us that as people, as communities, as cities, we're all going to have to figure out what's going to work in the future. And it may look very different than what's worked in the past. Penguins are us, you might say. Uh, they breathe the same air. They have to have food, a good home, a good environment. If one of those falls out of sync, it's troubling. So my question, you might say, in a very general euphemistic way. Are we going to be gentoos in the future or are we going to have a sinking population like some of the chinstrap and adelie populations? Meaning are we going to figure out either how to stop this warming or how to adapt to it? I don't know if we're going to be able to stop it. What I've been focusing a lot uh, upon is whether we're going to be able to adapt. William, what did you think about our adaptation message? Well, the thing that was so striking to me was that 
the birds to my eye and you helped me understand this are really very similar i mean they're distinct in certain ways they're slightly different in size and shape but they're largely living in the same place feeding on the same things trying to have children in the same environment right. and yet very subtle distinctions between them allow one species to succeed and the other two to struggle and that idea that simply one of the species has figured out maybe they're better swimmers maybe there's certain parts of their physiology that helps them get better and, and to succeed but that 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 skill that they have that the gen 2s have figured out um it, it, there's obviously an echo there for us because we are all going to be facing as this planet continues to warm we're all going to be struggling to how are we going to feed ourselves how are we going to fortify our cities how are we going to continue to live in a, in a planet that is changing right and it's hard not to see the Gentoos as a, in some ways, a lesson. I'm glad you got to see it, but it is heartrending when you really realize that the place is warming and things are changing and what does it mean for us and how are we going to adapt to those changes, hopefully like the Gentoos. I think that to simply go to a place like this as a tourist and to see it is fantastic and an important thing to do but if you don't appreciate what's going on below right. the surface if you don't know the research if you don't know the long-term longitudinal right. studies right. you don't you only get part of the picture and that's really what you did for us was help us to understand that there's more going on here than meets the eye so William the, the role of media covering a story like Antarctica and climate change and penguins and adapting to a changing world what role do you guys see dealing with this I mean I have been trying to cover climate change for almost 20 years now in different ways so we're always looking for stories that help us understand the way in which the climate is changing and what those impacts are. And once we heard about the work you've been doing in Antarctica, having a long-term study of a very particular mm. environment that we know is warming, and being able to look at those changes and what those impacts are on a very charismatic, television-friendly species was kind of an ideal environment for us in that sense, that we're always looking for ways to demonstrate what we cannot see. We cannot see the carbon right. in the air. We cannot see really what a warm atmosphere looks like, what warm oceans look like. I mean, yes, the Great Barrier Reef has been bleaching. We may lose that magnificent structure entirely. Those kinds of tangible examples, and Antarctica was a perfect one of them, that's a sort of a dream for us, to be able to go and look at tangible impacts of climate change, and you took us right there. You guys have done a great job helping us spread spread the word and people are really excited about the series and that's fantastic well you are a treasure and it's been a pleasure to get to know you and we cannot thank you enough for sharing your work with us and giving us license to go to the bottom of the world which we this is one of the most wonderful things about journalism is that we get to meet people like you in our lives and then piggyback on your work and use you as a lens through which to deepen our understanding. And it's been an incredible process. Thank you. I mean, you're really kind and I'm very happy you have penguins prancing <laughs> in your dreams now. Just watch out for the guano flying. <laughs>